Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. I regret to report that both our Jedi Order and the Republic have fallen, with the dark shadow of the Empire rising to take their place. This message is a warning and a reminder for any surviving Jedi. Trust in the Force. They've outgrown their age of rebellion, dull the Empire's edge. Defeated Imperial generals and the Pirate Queen's dredge. They've been soldiers and scoundrels, what's there left to be? How about Lasaka life, looking for their force and destiny? There's a seer, hermit, investigator, and teacher better. Watch your back, or vibe, or rings gonna reach you. Will this team find the light, or will darkness win the day? Find out with the heroes of the hardy and wave. Welcome to Heroes of the Hydean Way. This is a Star Wars actual play podcast where we're playing in Fantasy Flight Games Force and Destiny system. Or, well, we were. <laughs> this adventure has been inspired by Chronicles of the Gatekeeper as developed by Tim Cox and Max Brook. This is Act 3, Question and Answer, Episode 1. And I'm Ben, and I was the GM for this adventure. I'm Brandon, and I was Koba, the dog investigator. I'm Ren, and I was playing Skip the Colarin Weirdo. And I'm Leslie. I was playing Hillary the... And you will notice that we are missing Christine due to life things, but she will be contributing... Contributing? Mm. <laughs> if you if you die in Here's the Hiding Way, you die in real life, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to go that far, but... Um... So it has come to pass. <laughs> yeah. But so is she. But not really. Gonna, but Christine will contribute as able. We're going to composite her into this uh, episode with a green screen. <laughs> I mean, really, it's more going to be the uh, shawarma bit at the end, but yeah, we'll see. Typically, uh, questions are handled by our delightful Miss Christine, but as stated, she is unavailable at this time. So I volunteered to step in and thusly apologize for everything I do subsequently. Now I just picture a tiny, tiny dino dad, like, raising his hand and being all like, I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> and then everybody's like, no, don't give him the pointer. Also, <laughs> can I ask uh, if you said dino dad because you forgot the name of the species? Because I sure did. No, he's an Alina. I just Alina, like, that's right. I just really like the alliteration of um dynamic Dino Dad. Or mm -hmm. delightful or dastardly, I guess, supposing he has <laughs> yeah. an evil side. There's but... many adjectives that could be applied there. I'm gonna scroll through and try and split it up between people. We're gonna start mm -hmm. with the ever popular and helpful Mr. T, T three A. Questions for everyone. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Maybe I shouldn't have started here. Okay. <laughs> now that you've reached We're the end of the module. We're doing one question this episode. Uh, this how episode do you think about it both long. collectively and individually? Oh, uh, we can mind repeating. Who? Now that you've reached the end of the module, how do you think about it both collectively and individually? Thank you. I am. I mean, it's ended. It is. I am sure that Tim Cox and Max Brook are very talented storytellers. They are. I didn't love this story. Me neither. <laughs> and through other discussions that we've had that have not been on mic, it's my head canon. I, I have no proof that this was probably done up as a Knights of the Old Republic thing because then the locations and things make so much more sense. Then it being in the, like, the whole of Jorah makes more sense if it's in Knights of the Old Republic or the Old Republic era, where you can have, like, the Duke could then be more focal and actually be the one that you're fighting. It kind of feels like a rework of yeah. uh, an adventure that didn't quite work out. Actually, I did, I did like Tree Town and I did like the family squabbling that was happening there. You know, you're right. You're right. I liked set pieces of it. I liked a lot of the bits 
but and I respect that I'm coming at this as a player who did absolutely no research and has absolutely no context for the book other than what I experienced and heard you you all discuss beyond what we played and I don't know. I like bits. I like Tree Town. And actually I like the ideas of some of the things on Jora too. It's just it didn't seem entirely cohesive. That's its biggest weakness. As a full throughout adventure, it just Arbulin was great and honestly that would be enough to just run a adventure out of. Like just that first act, don't really worry about the rest of it. Go there, do that sort of stuff. Make it maybe a bit more in depth. In some ways it felt we were just getting the surface level of any of the actual conflicts that were going on in Tree Town, but also mm. we got enough we got enough for like a podcast and an actual play, but I could also see if we were just running as a home game, never getting out of there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I don't think that that would be a bad thing. I, I, I also feel like, and if you remember way back in the day before our series two, when I answered my questions about what does the edge of the empire mean about me, I very specifically went on a mini rant about how I don't really like Jedi's and I didn't ever really want to play in a Force and Destiny game. I. I'm not the audience for this game. I don't like Jedi. And I think that if you really are gung-ho about playing a Jedi character who's really interested in exploring the Force and what a lot of that Force stuff means, you will probably get some mileage out of this. But I, as evidenced by Skip, was just always sort of on the edge of like... Haha, <laughs> the Empire. Uh, no. Um, not really wanting to deal with Force stuff. And that's my own personal preference so so i don't think that my judging of this module is super fair because it comes from a place of just being like uh jedi is it jedi or is it force because i was never that interested in running a force character i don't know it's just like i don't play magic users it's just not the way my brain works but i know that there's a lot of baggage with jedi yeah i feel like um we certainly didn't make it easy for this to function because in large part we didn't want to play the game, I guess. Certainly in hindsight, I'm kind of like, maybe we just should have had a different cast, <laughs> you know, which is not a knock on anybody individually or anything like that. Well, it's not that I, I, cause like the four of us play really well together and I was very excited for that. I just thought that my lack of interest in force stuff would be. Well, and that's, and that's why I say this because like, I think we kind of went in to this season with a lot of us not really, I don't know, wanting to do the premise of this season. And, and I think that maybe should have just been a, a warning that we should have um, made different decisions. Well, in retrospect, you're absolutely right, Brandon. Ren, you're absolutely right. As four players, everyone here plays really well together. And as a group, it was a really cohesive group, but this was the wrong adventure for the cast. Mm -hmm. The thing was, is for... We were somewhat tied into a, well, we've done Age of Rebellion, we've done Age of the Empire. Well, now for the show's reason d'etre, well, now we've got to do Force and Destiny so we can do the three different lines. Yeah. Also, in all seriousness, I wasn't entirely certain I was going to be able to see by the end of the series that my eyesight going into it was in such a state that I was relatively certain I was going to be blind halfway through, if not, like, by now, definitely. I mean, we were all put through the life ringer over these two years. Yeah. That's true. Oh, my gosh. We started not too long after COVID started. Well, we started designing our characters before COVID existed, mm -hmm. and we, yeah, we started recording, right. like, right after quarantine. Because we started recording, what, in April? 
Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So this this particular chapter of the podcast has taken the entirety <laughs> of the pandemic. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, to across point, yeah. the five of us, we had major medical issues. We had family loss. We had new jobs. We had one marriage. I mean, we all, even yeah. without the pandemic, it was one hell of a ride. Yeah, we've had, all mm-hmm. had a bumpy couple of years in our own ways. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I agree with the notion that, like, for Heroes of the Hydean Way, Force and Destiny was the right call for Season 3. At the same time, going into Season 2, half the cast changed, right? Like, yeah. That, that, even before David became unable to play. Like, Season 2 began with, hey, we've got a couple new people on the show. So it would not have been weird for the show to similarly yeah. kind of take a step back and ask, you know, do we have the best cast for this uh, for this story? And I probably should have taken a step back and been like, is there somebody else who is just way more excited about Force stuff? Because I would love to hang out with you all still, but I don't really care about Jedi. So, yeah, I probably should have. But here out. we are, and <laughs> yeah, here I mean, we I finished. I definitely do not want this answer to be like, shame on everybody who, I don't know, didn't leave the show of their own accord, right? <laughs> Here's the other point to that question, and about the module, even if you're entirely there with it, even if you're not there with it, there still should be a through-line story that goes between the different things, and... I don't think that there's a through line to it. Like in Mask of the Pirate Queen, there's the Pirate Queen. And you're trying, the act one is trying to take down the Pirate Queen and you get the decoy. Uh, End of act two and you are trying to, but the Pirate Queen gets away. And now act three is revenge upon the Pirate Queen and actually getting the Pirate Queen. Like there's an actual through line for it. Of the FFG adventures, there's three adventures that I can come up with that actually have a start, middle, and end for the actual story. I will be completely uh, uh, upfront. I cannot finish Ghosts of Dathomir, which is also the reason why Ghosts of Dathomir was never considered. A force campaign that goes to Toydaria at the start. So, and has a side blurb in it on... Yeah, and anyone who has mind affecting force powers, they don't work unless you want them to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for context, for people who might not remember, Toydarians can't be swayed by the force. They can be physically affected, though, right? They're not like. Yes. Okay. But then for an entire act, you're without the ability to do any sort of mental manipulation. Like, there's no way of doing the, these are not the droids you're looking for type stuff. It's even the uh, shadowy type stuff of you don't see me. Yeah. That doesn't work. That enrages me. So that was why it wasn't considered at all. Yeah. I can hear how much it got up your nose. Even though apparently the main antagonist for it just got brought into the big book of Sith. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think. It's like, your mind tricks don't work on me. Only money. Exactly. Yeah. There's a few species in Star Wars that just are immune to the mental effects of the Force, and the Toydarians are... Uh, what are other ones? Among them. Really really quick yeah. sidetrack. Them and Huts. Um, I, I want to address Leslie's note in the text chat. Okay. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. Well, since we're, yeah, since we're kind of hedging around it, Adam Beltane, the delightful whatever he is, instigator of Force <laughs> Majeure, Asked Ben, by Act 3, your intro had changed to inspired by, rather than directly running it. Uh, And he was wondering how different from the written adventure did it end up. I was also kind of wondering, because I know, as we previously discussed, like seconds ago, we're kind of (laughs) all in a weird place about the whole Jedi Force thing. And it kind of pulled us out of the main book. This adventure has many structural problems from a throughput of a actual single MacGuffin, a single driving force for the players to be going for. 
and the inspired by Chronicles of the Gatekeeper shift was always going to happen. It happened a lot more dramatically to a point than was originally intended. But Act 3 of the entire adventure is just a mess because when originally, and I've probably said this somewhere else, Act 1 is your Age of Rebellion bit. Act 2 is your Edge of the Empire bit. And Act 3 is your Force and Destiny bit. Which, okay, sure, that that is a way of doing it, I but I can see themes that are wanting to go through it, but I don't see an actual hook that I'm trying to drag, uh, that you can drag players through. As much as a GM, I was mildly disappointed in how uh, Skip was reacting to Ward, narratively, there is no reason for Skip to care one wits about Ward. Yeah. And going through the entire adventure, Ward is a tertiary character. Ward is as useful to the adventure, like Ward, the living bio-being, is as useful to the adventure as the Admiral in Friends Like These. Yes, they are the instigator of all the stuff, but if they're a windswept skeleton at the end, or they're a living being, no one's really going to notice. It's going to change a little bit in the end, but like Act 3 was, instead of it being even a story that you could kind of reconstruct, it was a couple set pieces and a few concepts. The very first part started with this Knights of the Old Republic-esque detour, which then for a bit of time I was going to do a Rise of Skywalker Death Star bit, but... I talked myself out of it. And then Morban, Corban was what it was, which had a few cool set pieces, but that was it. Like, even in the book, there's just not much there. Yeah. I, uh, Chronicles of the Gatekeeper is one of the few adventure modules I actually have a copy of. I think probably because I wanted the Sathari. Because I, mm-hmm. I basically never run modules myself. But since I had it earlier today, I was just like, I'm going to go poke through it and kind of like see what's on the page, which, which, you know, of course, I hadn't done before we played it or anything. I wasn't going to spoil stuff or be like, I know the answer to this uh, to this plot thing because I read ahead. And it really is like the adventure requires your characters to want to find Ward. There's no real reason to do that. Yeah. And because, uh, to Ben's point, the the Act 3 really is just sort of like, you get here and then there's a few encounters probably with like some Sith ghosts and stuff. And then you get to the end and Ward is there and... Right. And there's, there's a boss fight, but it's not a boss fight because Ward has like an agenda. It's a boss fight because Ward foresaw that we would kill him, the player characters would kill him. And so wait, that's actually in the book. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, so here's the thing about word in the book. (laughs) Yeah. Word is different in the uh, heroes thing. Here's, here's a lot of things. Here's my relatively quickly uh, established read on things. Cause like I, I've been, I've been griping about the lack of stakes in this campaign the entire time. Um, uh, I would seriously argue, you can tell exactly when Brandon started to complain about the lack of stakes and lack of push on it by a very simple introduction. Come yeah. On. And and I still wish there was more than that, but that was definitely an adaptation because Carl doesn't exist yeah. in the book. Um, no. and, and and I knew that, like you had said as much. Because the, the, the way that the arc of this story goes on paper is you find the holocron. It gives you a couple of ways of like, here's some suggestions, but it really doesn't matter. They find the holocron and so they follow it. So you already, you need to come to the table with a group of players who are going to be compelled enough by finding a mysterious holocron to follow its trail, right? Which, yes, any RPG campaign... You, you need to make sure you come to the table with characters who are going to want to go on the adventure in the first place. But I, I do think that we ultimately d- didn't come to the table with characters who wanted to go on this adventure versus some other adventure. Yeah. 
so that was like problem number one. But so you go to Arboin and you find out about Markov and, and stuff. That stuff went pretty by the book. The family stuff was largely added. Mm. Like the seeds of that are there, but the amount that we got into it was was not elaborated upon in in the module. And then once you get to Jora, the notion I think is supposed to be that the entire driving thing about all of your adventures on Jora are sort of these incidents you get into that all illustrate ways in which Ward messed stuff up, right? Yeah. I feel like I didn't grok a lot of that from that part of the adventure, but I might have just not been paying close enough attention. That could entirely be the case. But regardless, the the notion is still... Yeah, some of these parts of the adventure are because somebody tries to kill you, but they try to kill you because Ward did something 20 years ago or whatnot, and now they distrust everybody with a lightsaber. And ultimately, you're just like kind of strung along to keep seeing these different opposing viewpoints on Ward. Was he good? Was he bad? Like, what happened? Etc. And then the answer to that is that Ward's foresight, basically he saw all kinds of bad things happen. And when he tried to stop them, he just always caused them, right? So, like, he saw his other Jedi friends lose faith in him. And so he tried to intervene when they were, like, accepting the Separatist ceasefire because he thought that he had foreseen them, like, causing a problem when, in fact, he's the one who ultimately causes that fight. And then he goes to Moraband because he foresaw that he would die there at the hands of some other Jedi didn't realize that that prophecy was 20 years down the road because this is the PCs that he sees in this prophecy. And so by the time you actually find him, he's like, okay, I, I saw that you're going to kill me. This is, this is the prophecy I saw. It is set, but I don't want to be killed. So I'm just going to fight you. He, he's even just kind of like, I know I'm going to lose because I saw you killing me but i don't want to just let you do it <laughs> it's kind of the that's so raven problem you only get to look at the future through a keyhole and then you end up causing your own problems yeah and, and so there's there's an element where the adventure i think is trying to get at a question that is not alien to star wars of like whether or not the future is written especially when it comes to force visions ward decided that it was because every time he tried to treat it like it wasn't, it went badly and his visions just became true because of his actions. But I mean, by the time you find him, it's just kind of, you're just sort of fulfilling his prophecy. Probably you can talk him down, but it's not, it's not because you find him and he's like twirling his mustache, preparing to leave the planet and do something evil or, or whatever. Like, like it's very much, it's very much the Raiders of the Lost Ark thing. And incidentally, that's one of my favorite movies despite this problem. But <laughs> the thing about it is this adventure and Raiders of the Lost Ark have that issue where if the player characters do not go on the adventure, nothing changes. There's no adventure and the danger is not realized. Yeah. If, if the player character, you know, if, if, if Indy doesn't help the Nazis or doesn't doesn't try to beat the Nazis to finding the Ark, uh, then the Nazis find the Ark and then they open it and they all die because the Ark kills them. Just like if Indy, w what happens in the movie. Sorry, spoilers for Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think it's old <laughs> enough. That's OK. Yeah. Uh, likewise, in this adventure, if the heroes find the holocron and just decide, nope. Then Ward is just still on Moribund, kind of waiting for the people he saw in his vision would come and kill him there to come and kill him there. <laughs> so what this, this honestly sounds like to me, listening to what you're telling me about the context, of it, this sounds like a novel, not like an adventure path, because it mm -hmm. can't be an adventure path without telling the characters what's going on with Ward. I've got more with a video game, but same diff. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like it's, it's, it needs, more programming and like some cutscenes, which don't work as well at a table. 
Yeah, the the trick is that like so many pieces of it, like the whole the whole Jorah section, like all of the different little things you can do, and, and many of them are ones we encountered. A few I saw in there, I don't think were really used at all, but like they're all kind of optional. It's kind of like do X number of these things, right? They're all supposed to be, it seems, these little nuggets of adventure where you go on this adventure, which is an adventure of its own sort on a small level, like, you know, uh, beat up the biker gang because they're bad, but also dealing with them will reveal some aspect of the setting that is a consequence of Ward's past actions, so that you're kind of like, you're going on all these little sort of episodic adventures almost, but in so doing, you're kind of getting the arc of like Ward's character and his fall, which is fine, but yeah, not super suited to TTRPGs anyway. Yeah. We're probably steamrolling into another question, but one thing that for the Dora section, if I was doing it at a table or if I was kind of thinking ahead and had it a lot more plotted out for an actual play, like say we recorded everything and then put it out, which that would be a lot of recording. But having notes, like ending every episode with like a note from Ward and essentially doing Ward's journals or something like that, or having like specific pieces from the holocron and saying something from Ward's point of view, I think that probably would have helped a bit for contextualizing what's going on. Yeah. Like, ultimately, if you if you come in here with a group of characters who are inclined to want to solve that mystery anyway, you're in a lot better shape. But even then, it's probably tough to execute. Yeah, like, that's the main crux of my thinking is, yeah, you can get all this, but... The entire adventure is tracking the trail of something that happened 20 years ago and making people who are running through it now care about that. Jorah's all the effects of what have happened. Like he was one of the commanders in this place during the Clone Wars. Uh, There's one that wasn't used where there's a prisoner who's still in the Imperial prison who was put there by Ward and just no one has released him. Mm Mm-hmm. No reason to be jailed other than Ward said, put this guy in jail. Well, I think there's a lot of places where you could do a very specific buy-in. Because I can see the Ward adventure working if we are people that grew up on Jorah. Mm -hmm. And we want to understand what happened. Like, maybe one of us met that guy or the, the loner from the tower, you know. But the, the general buy-in is not there even listening to what you guys are saying about what's in there unless we're getting those little snippets contextualizing ward in his head it's a big miss but i mean we are playing a game with four characters making a show and it's just a lot to ask yeah without having like it's you know what it feels like it would need to be (sighs) Anybody ever played the old uh, Clue VCR game? Oh, yeah. So you have the 20 minutes or the 10 minute video that you watch that gives you the full initial concept. And then everybody plays the game for a little while. And then you have a little uh, five minutes, you know, where you see all of the people potentially pick up their murder weapons. And then you play the game, that kind of thing. But that's not what we're doing. We're playing a TTRPG. And, Mm -hmm. you know, um But I'm going to kind of move us on because there are many questions coming. And I'm going to pull up Chris. I apologize. Stoson? Stoison? Station on running games in general. I apparently copied it improperly from the email. In listening to the current season, I'm interested in how experience is being awarded. Are you following the 5 XP an hour of, mm. of gaming, or are you following something else? How long is a session that turns into an hour and 20-minute episode? Are there bonus experiences awarded for things? it will be interesting to hear a uh, breakdown of how it was awarded and how that lines up with the character's development. I'm trying to get the balance right in my own games and would like to see other examples. I didn't even know it was 5 XP per however much increment of time. That's a conversation we have had on the show before, but I think we had it like in season one. 
Yeah, I think we do kind of like story beats, right? Like you, you award XP for like hitting certain notes. Uh, you get extra for hitting certain notes. Yeah. And in the back of an act, there are certain... Oh, you've saved the family on Sulukamai. Okay, you get five XP for that. You mm. took, uh, what's his name, prisoner in the first one. Five XP for that. Generally, I we record for the equivalent of three hours, so it does Give technically time. fit. Like three hours of actual play as opposed to the other time around. Yeah, I guess the the like behind the curtain, I guess, here is that we normal recordings for us become two episodes. Yeah. Yeah, we play for three to four hours. That usually becomes two episodes of mm-hmm. of stuff and been pretty consistently gives us 15 experience each each session that we play um so it, roughly five per gameplay hour plus the stuff ben was just listing as far as um the bonuses the module dictates and stuff like the five xp an hour is a derivation of what's in the actual core book of saying roughly 15 a session and since your average session is roughly three hours, simple division gets yeah. you five XP an hour. Yeah. And it works. It mm-hmm. really does. Whether it's 15 a session, five XP an hour, there's a few other tricks that, like, there's a different trick that I like doing in my home games, which it helps celebrate what people are doing that are seen by everyone else, which mine is, since I just brought it up, uh, 10 XP for the session and then 5 XP that everyone can give away to someone else for whether it's a in-person like whether it's to the player whether it's to the player's characters some cool thing that happened some clutch thing that happened but it's between players that's cool the thing that I have found with it is that it helps celebrate what's going on in the as the group and it brings a group together in a celebration at the end of the uh, night. Yeah. If you've got a group that is like about wanting to have that kind of experience, which is in my opinion, the best kind of group though, not every group mm-hmm. is that then, then yeah, that sounds pretty rad. Um, I guess the, the, to, to come at the question about balance of XP from a like less specifically heroes, direction like ultimately five per gameplay hour is about what the book says but in the end the right balance is going to depend on your players Mm -hmm. and what they want a lot of that math uh in the book is based upon sort of an, an average player group that gets an average amount of stuff done and requires an average in the designer's experience amount of like wanting to feel like their play their character has developed mechanically and everything but there's always going to be exceptions to that maybe your players would rather get experience at junctures that means that like their leveling happens when there's actually time in a break of a story rather than in the middle of it which can kind of be one thing you know maybe they prefer a more slow burn sort of deal maybe uh they really just want a lot of xp and if you're comfortable running characters that are getting 20 a night or, or whatnot, uh, go for it. Like that's, I actually have done 10 XP an hour. Hmm. It does not entirely break things. Stormtroopers are still deadly. Yeah. And like, ultimately if that's uh, a lot of how often you award XP and, and in what quantities is a question about the sort of tone of your game, just as many other parts of GMing are. So, you know, if we take a Jedi game, for example, if you want a like Force Unleashed style campaign or something, yeah, crank it up, <laughs> ten XP an hour or whatever, because that'll that'll give you that. Like last week, we were barely able to swing a lightsaber. This week, we pull Star Destroyers out of orbit. It's fine, you know. While on the other end, if you want kind of a grittier game, uh, and of course, you should make sure that that's what your players want, then maybe a slower than five per hour is sort of a, a compelling element of the game as a whole. Um, so yeah, 
There's lots of ways to do it. Think about what that power curve means for the tone of your game and the kind of adventures that it's going to give the players and ask if that's the tone that you are going for. Speaking of uh, tone, just going to hop in here and keep us moving uh, and guess on a pronunciation again. Hurley asks, how does the story of your character or group fit with the rest of the stories of Star Wars? Are there themes or characters or aesthetics that meshed well or stuck out? I'm going to pick on Ren because he's been (laughs) hanging out there being polite and quiet while the uh, GMs have been kind of GMing at us. Not in a... An inappropriate context, just <laughs> Ren's being quiet, so I'm being picky. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm just really tired. Um, I, uh, well, so I picked Skip because Kalarans are such a weird alien that I was really interested in exploring. And I, I think I, I wish I had leaned in more on weird alien biology stuff with the Calarin thing. Because I feel like weird alien stuff is a big theme of Star Wars. <laughs> um, so I think aesthetically Skip fit uh, Star Wars. But um, I don't know if Skip even really had a theme. I know you all tried to make Skip the protagonist. <laughs> I, I don't think we tried, Brad. <laughs> I think it kind of started to I, fall I together. I think it came around to the end where Skip was not the protagonist and that Cash was. Personally. I think you're right. I won't argue the point, but still. I would also argue that Skip's theme is called to Adventure by Kevin McLeod. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not really sure what else to say about this question. I don't... I think the the, the journey of kind of... I want to... I hate to say self-discovery because it it, it... it It's one of those phrases that has a lot of pejorative context in popular culture, but mm. the idea of being pulled into something bigger than yourself and then trying to step up and understand yourself within that context... Uh, is is a Star Wars theme. And I think that makes sense for Skip. And I think the tired warrior finding their own rhythms within a different or changing galaxy also makes sense for Kesh in Star Wars. I have no idea about Hillary. I don't know. He was just a dude, I guess. <laughs> Caught in um, a whole lot of chaos, but found family I feel is also a not common, but not unfamiliar theme mm. in Star Wars. But I don't have a yeah, full sure. breadth mm-hmm. experience because I don't have really any uh, EU or Legends experience. But yeah. like Rebels and that stuff definitely seems like found family. Yeah, Rebels is yeah. definitely found family stuff. And, and, you know, the movies themselves, with the possible exception of the uh, prequel trilogy, are are also very much that like the the original trilogy is Han, Luke and Leia becoming a family unit, even before they realize that two of them are related by blood. Um, (laughs) Hey, so they literally found family. That's true. They did literally find family. And then the the sequel trilogy, make me find a rim shot, you know, does, (laughs) does the same sort of thing with Ray and Finn and Poe. Heavy side. (laughs) <laughs> so, so yeah, that's definitely a a Star Wars thing. As as our regular people caught up in irregular things, which I think covers Hillary and Koba um, in in their own ways. Yeah. Okay. I think a thing about our story that didn't fit with Star Wars is. The general lack of heroism. Mm. Was it all the Star Trek jokes? Maybe also that. Because um, <laughs> after Arboween, I have trouble putting my finger on a lot of instances where we as a group went and did heroic things. Yeah, I 
gotta agree with that just on a like all of the big fights all of that sort of stuff has been after arbuene has been stuff coming to you yeah um and some of it is like again jorah kind of only gives some L- now the the prison thing and i think maybe the like retired clone trooper thing um the old clone trooper would have been kind of interesting and then yeah. also if you sit around there long enough you can actually top <laughs> you can topple the head of the underworld there who's actually in control of the city and the uh, essentially either install someone or also topple the duke who's there who is yeah didn't even show up in the show technically he's the one who hired Dallin, but no one cares Really? I mean, that's really out of the way feeling. Yeah, exactly. But you know, we've had that conversation. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's he's an imperial. Like ultimately, like a lot of the yeah. a lot of the opportunities for heroism that exist in this module are of the topple the imperial or imperial sympathizers who are in various levels of power at these places you go visit, and we always avoided the imperials if at all possible. We actually were just like generally very fight avoidant, Mm -hmm. which in retrospect, I'm kind of like, well, the thing about star Wars is that wars is in the name. And I, and I'm not just saying that to be flippant, like the vocabulary for verbs in star Wars is very much like to do heroic things. You have to be, prepared to fight for it because at some point you will need to and like yeah there are star wars characters who do great things via nonviolent means or try not to resort to violence as the first recourse but it always gets there eventually right like leia's whole deal is that yes she is a very savvy politician she's very good at negotiation at inspiration, at building support, she also kicks a lot of ass. She does get them essentially out of the Death Star. Yeah, sometimes sometimes she needs to fight. That's just the way it is. And she's good at that too. Leia's the best. I love her. Leia is, Leia is the best. And, and, and you know, this is, this is an element of pretty much all flavors of, of Star Wars, is that that's kind of a part of it. And I don't think that that's necessarily just because it's exciting. Sometimes it is just because it's exciting, but like, I'm kind of just sort of like, if, if you're not getting in fights relatively regularly, are you even playing a star Wars game? Mm. I'm, I'm as much for not combat focused RPGs as the next guy. But when I want to do that, I'm probably not going to choose star Wars as the setting, but I think that's kind of where we landed was we were sort of like trying to contort both this system, which is still ultimately a combat based system. Yeah, because really any system whose most complicated mechanical chunk is combat is a combat based system, no matter how much you can use it for games that aren't that interesting. OK. And, and then, you know, Star Wars begin as a setting. Both both Star Wars as a setting and Star Wars as a system are not super well equipped to do a nonviolent story. Should I should I rest control again? I mean, sure, sure. All right, so, um, Sorail or Sorail? Sorail sounds like a Bajoran. <laughs> I mean... Might have started watching DS9 again. Yeah. It does rhyme with Barile. Yeah. Oh, that must be why it's... Okay, that, yeah. there we go. Um, question to the players for the whole adventure. Do you feel like the personality of your character evolved, and if so, in what way? No. A little. I don't know about Hillary. I mean, I I think his attitude evolved, but not his personality. Like, he kind of still found refuge in being dad. I think looking at Skip, you kind of... I feel like it, it, I'm not calling you the protagonist. <laughs> I'm just saying that of all the the characters that butted their heads against something, your headbutt was the most contrasted with where you started. It's true. 
I I feel like I would say that Skip didn't so much change, like evolve personality wise because I I don't know I I I feel more like Skip just matured a little a little only a little vaguely but not necessarily like a huge personality shift although it it could be there I don't remember it was several years ago that we started playing this yeah I would vaguely offer up that Skip found a broader family because Skip was such a loner at the start well Skip had Gudge yeah it's true but only Gudge. And now Skip has Gudge and Hillary. Well, Skip doesn't have Gudge anymore. That's right. Now Skip has Hillary. Well, Skip will have <laughs> Gudge again when Skip gives in and calls Koba at the probably inappropriate time. Yeah. So probably like three days from the departure. Just about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting three-way conversation to edit. Skip, <laughs> Gudge, and Koba. Work? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like Skip got a little cynical at the end. I will give, I will give them that. Yeah, that was kind of one of the things I was thinking about because Skip started out all, all um, peach pie and sunshine, not necessarily in naivete, but in hope. Ward just just threw a monkey wrench in the universe. Yeah, because, I mean, for a little while I was trying to play on this whole, like, Skip saw Ward as, like, a potential mentor sort of thing, and then was just so very disappointed. Oh, Because because Box Ward is very different than Ward Ward. Box Mm -hmm. Ward was, like, kind uncle, you know, with the answers and some guidance. That teacher that has you stay after school because they want to help you. And Ward Ward cut off Skip's leg. <laughs> and Ward Ward was a mess. I mean, that was pure luck. Oh my gosh, but what luck was it? Good golly. Oh my goodness. Good golly. I want to throw out two more questions. One is directly applicable to the comment that was just made. One, I want, I want to do a fun one for the end. Cool. But let's look at, I'm sorry, I'm going to double up on Sir... Sorile. I'm going to stick with that because I said it. Uh, and ask Ben, why did Ward attack when he did? Sorile expected him to play God, let everyone else fight, and then try to pick up the winner as an apprentice. And subsequently, why skip? Because it seems like the uh, logical target would have been Cash, who feels quote unquote similar and would be the most dangerous combatant, or Hillary, who, with all the speeches, I apologize, I am a loudmouth. Uh, with all the speeches, seem to be the de facto leader of the group. Okay, to the lead mouth thing. You do really good speeches, so. Thank you. Okay, I've been preparing for this since I asked Sorrel to clarify the question, and I really do appreciate the clarification for the question. I've been thinking this over too much in my head, so we kind of need to go off on a slight tangent, so very tailsy. I think this portion of this specific block of the altar power is not as baked as it needs to be. The reason being is that the long and the short of it is I don't think it does enough damage. I don't think it gives a high enough corrosive value to matter in situations like this. There's other questions that are related to this, but uh, in specifics, doing sand on someone in full laminate armor Doing sand abrasion, doing sand corrosion on someone in full laminate armor feels like I should be applying their soak to it. Which, at corrosive 3, then, if anyone's in full laminate armor, just doesn't apply. As a GM wanting the player to succeed, that felt like I was shortchanging Ren. Because Ren had this really good idea for what Skip would do, and... Okay, well, it should succeed. And I couldn't come up with a reason for it not to. And it isn't until Sorrel asked this question that I came up with the, well, let's do double what the force rating was instead of what I did, which was just have it bypass soak. If it was not chlorine gas or something like that, that would bypass the suit in another way. It makes more sense. So you have a character sandblasting, which seems to be a very powerful thing. 
in the end, Ward attacked, wanting to see how everyone was going, and essentially took a round to figure out, all right, so yeah, it's going to be a four-on-one fight, or in this case, at that point, it was a three-on-one fight. Mechanically, it was entirely based around, much like the end of Act 2, a two Demesis NPC versus the player group. So, essentially an equality in actions. Four versus four. I had to have Ward get in there at some point, otherwise the group would just eat Carl, and then they would eat Ward when Ward attacked. Because even with the split Nemesis actions and Carl in Kurtosis, they would just eat him. Because four people attacking, even three people just attacking him, is going to whittle him down even if he's parrying and taking three damage here, three damage there, well, now he's just going to strain out and then get stabbed. So Ward had to enter into the fight. And he spent a entire round trying to figure out what was going on with that, who was doing what, and Skip was doing a lot of damage. Narratively, was doing a lot of damage. Eh, practically was doing three per round. So not huge, but consistent. That's for why did Ward attack when he did. It was seeing how everything was and then, okay, this is sort of a settled state. Let's upend it. See how everyone reacts. And then why did Ward attack skip? Koba's a good answer on account of Koba has two lightsabers and is in direct fighting with Carl. Kesh is a good answer because Kesh has a lightsaber and is in a direct fight with Carl. So there's an engaged trio of combatants. Not engaged, you've got Skip and Hillary. Skip is actually doing something, something that very visually is striking and also visually is disturbing because as someone who is trying to abrade someone into, they're trying to do damage by abrading someone. It's one of those things of like, say you try using a flame projector on someone and they catch fire, something like that. It's you sort of look at that person a little more darkly. And Hillary had just had talked, had stepped off, but hadn't healed yet. There's Skip, who is doing damage, who is part of the fight and is on their own. So try throwing at the one doing damage that's not engaged. Get them engaged, see what they do. It was a medium range throw that he got lucky. He got so lucky on the amount of advantage. And then the roll for the crit was pure luck that it somehow rolled exactly enough to add the extra 20 to get maimed. I was absolutely shocked that that happened. That Ward is throwing in to Skip to get Skip's attention. That made sense to me at the time and still essentially does. But the effect of that was way outside of any expectations. I figured that Skip would be able to parry some of the damage, and it would take Skip down to about half health, because I the one disadvantage I've got is I don't look at my player's character sheets at all. So I really have no idea what's going on with the player characters. That everyone went into this injured, except Hillary, completely was lost on me. I did the damage, and Skip was hanging on by a single wound at their wound threshold. (laughs) It was shocking. And you didn't didn't take Skip down? It was the second throw, or was it you took Skip down and then you took Skip down again? It was rough. That's what I remember, is that it, it it was rough, and somebody had already joked about losing a limb. The lightsaber throw happened, Skip's leg comes off, that's the end of that episode. Next episode, Hillary runs over, heals up Skip, Ward comes over to Skip. And Ward tries to punch out Skip, but force roll doesn't go the right way on the brawn check, and it's a draw. No damage is done to Skip, and the parrying doesn't happen, it's just, essentially he misses. On account of, it was a role that I just wanted to do, because 
within Enhance, at one of the levels, you can add Force Dice to Brawl checks. And I have never done that before. I figured that was my one chance of being able to do it. Figured it was worth a shot. It came so close. But didn't want to spend this frame, as you can hear in the episode. At that point, Ward was wanting to knock out Skip. Then at that point, Skip uh, rightly switches to do the sand thing on Ward. Ward then uses uh, his lightsaber to actually knock out Skip at that point. Doing the second wound, which was technically a lower roll, but more brutal in that it removed the ability to spend strain. I think I'm more confused than when you started answering the question. Basically, Skip was being terrifying. Okay. Like, lightsaber fighting is lightsaber fighting, but you've got somebody who's controlling the elements. Sure. I'm a wizard! You are a wizard, Skip. (laughs) It's just not as as satisfying with only one syllable. Uh, Oh, here we go. You are a wizard, Skippington. (laughs) No, that's too many syllables, though. Skippy. <laughs> Alas. Sorry. Word came in mostly because mechanically you guys were going to eat Carl in yeah. the next two rounds, if not. I, I understand that part. <laughs> and Skip was the one not engaged actually attacking. Okay. It, because the choice was Skip or Hillary. Because Cash and Koba were in melee combat already. And yeah, lightsaber combat... I mean, it's lightsaber combat. If Carl couldn't deal with it or Kesh couldn't deal with it, well, that's on them. Mm-hmm. I do want to say that I feel like Cortos' armor is, yes, very badass. But there's gaps in there somewhere. And sand. <laughs> it gets everywhere. It gets yeah. everywhere. It's coarse. And that's why I thought it made sense that it that a little bit did happen you know i agree that does make sense well and that's the reason why i put it through removed his armor from the equation that you were doing the three damage every round to him sand is also a very physical thing so it just felt like otherwise for the sandstorms that y'all were going through until skip put up the barrier it should have been doing damage to you as well which it felt too mechanical Mm. that's the other reason why personally I would double the amount of damage that it would do because that way even if you are applying soak it would still get through all of the soak of anyone you're likely to go against Mm. also it makes lower uh, levels more useful okay so that answer went a little bit longer (laughs) do we want to do the sensible question that Brandon suggested, which kind of is part of a character discussion that we've already had, or do we want to end on something short? I feel like something short and fun, because I feel yeah. like Brandon's suggestion for a question could also go long. Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, I was just suggesting it because it seemed like a very logical next question after the question before. Yeah, I kind of, yeah. like I said, I've been scrolling too much, I think. I really wanted to get to one of Ren's questions in this episode since Ren asked for. Hey, I was just, you know, being proactive. No, I like it. Uh, um, I think awesome. which Power Ranger yes. you should be in the lightning round, so I don't have to answer. Yeah, but... it's a lightning round question. Okay, oh, come on. Um, I wanted answering. everyone's answer. I don't yeah, know no, Jack Squad you... about the Power Rangers. Well, which color, color Power Ranger would you be? Blue. I don't know. Okay. Um, That's fine. Sold. Okay. Now you can answer it again. Okay. We can move it. Um, in lightning <laughs> I'm I'm choosing for our last question, though, since we're talking about scary people doing scary things. If our characters had fallen to the dark side, what would their Darth names have been? Oh, good golly. Ken, Kaler, that is a great (laughs) question, and I love it. And I can answer if nobody else is ready. I'm not ready. Hold on. Darth Icky is taken, so we we can't say that. Did you say Icky? Yeah, that was, um... George Lucas's suggestion for what to name the character Starkiller from uh, Force Unleashed. Darth Icky. What, what, like, yucky? I-C-K-Y, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Hmm. 
Somebody just needs to keep saying no to that man sometimes. Yes. <laughs> sometimes. What I'm doing is I'm looking up the scientific name of Mudskipper. I like it. I like it a lot. I was I mean, just. This is good. Uh, Hillary is very much about the family and the brand. So if he went whole hog into the <laughs> evil, he oh, would just this. be Darth Oruk. Um, but he would be Hillary, Darth Oruk, Dark Lord, High Lord. <laughs> yes. I love it. That is amazing. Or Lord Dark Lord. I'm not sure. I have a fantastic answer because there is a there is a type of mudskipper whose scientific name is who that that first word's gonna get me um periophthalmus barbarous mm. so skip would be Darth barbarous I like it I like it a lot because that sounds very right. stabby barbaric <laughs> yes. <laughs> Either that or very musical, Darth Barbara Streisand. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kobo would be Darth Tenebrous. What does that mean? Oh, it's a word that means shadowy or. That's nice. You know. I mean, now I want to have oh. a Darth Penumbra. It is too. just a word. Because <laughs> many many Darth names are just an adjective that means something evil or dark, or it's. An adjective with a syllable removed, such as Sidious, Darth Sidious, mm. who is insidious. Eh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess. Darth, Darth do not have to stretch very far. Darth Icky no. technically <laughs> fits the pattern. Uh, it does, yes. Because yeah. a lot of those Darth things were probably thought up by George Lucas. Ben, if you want to pick an NPC to join the party, Ken would, would appreciate that. Oh, yeah, what's Darth Carl? <laughs> <laughs> he works the camera. <laughs> Carl, he knows what all these buttons... Oh, that's Carl's theme song. It would have to be <laughs> evil for extra credit, Carl. <sighs> Sorry. See, the thing is, is that there's no way Carl is getting up to Darth. He would just get cut down. <laughs> He's like 11th brother, and then at some point... One of the others just kills him because he gets annoying or something like that. Like, there's just no way that that guy is able to get to a power level where he doesn't get out of the pool so that Sidious could even consider giving him a Darth name or making him worthwhile having a Darth name. So you're saying he doesn't come out on top of the rule of two. So what is the Darth name? He has written all over his evil notebooks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. Carl plus the dark side equals. Would it be like an old lightning bolt instead of a heart? Yeah, yeah, it would. And I'm hmm, fumbling for an idea here. I don't know. Is there an evil form of fabulous? Darth Fabus. Okay, Fabus actually, yeah, sounds like it would work. It's probably spell the pH. <laughs> yeah I mean there is that uh... you can also go with a noun of some sort I mean there's a Darth Crate there's a Darth Talon I guess they're legends but still yeah Darth Bane isn't legends I don't know I would probably go with like Darth Dante or something like that sure Darth Hauser comma MD <laughs> <laughs> that, that would work. Do, does does the does the audience realize? Uh, oh, what, what, I don't know that they the, do. Would the audience know? Yeah, I really don't. Because I don't remember the you, name of that actor. But Neil Patrick Harris, right? Yeah, because Carl is taken exactly like it is Carl from Starship Troopers. What's his name from um, Bear, un Barney? Unfortunate Events? Klaus? Oh, he's uh, Count Olaf, right? Oh. Yes. I don't know what Count Olaf's <laughs> other name <laughs> is. He's Dark Glendathus. Count. <laughs> yes, yes, yes! Dark Glendathus! <laughs> <laughs> yes, that works. Darth Glendathus. Carl is the name of the character in Starship Troopers, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it Carl came from the foul name of the 
because I was showing you a picture of Carl from Starship Troopers because I had it in my head. This is what Carl looks like. And then whatever name I had at the time went by the wayside because the file name was Carl. <laughs> and for context, the reason Leslie can't take the name Carl seriously is because she always pictures Carl from Phineas and Ferb. So in my head, it's now Darth Coconuts. Because I've never seen Starship Troopers. <gasps> or read Starship Leslie. Troopers, presumably. I can understand why. Okay, at this point, it's like midway in the Paul Verhoeven canon. I love it so much. I, I feel like it's a relatively important piece of Paul Verhoeven canon. I mean, I mean, They're taking are- Starship Troopers and turning it into a critique of Starship Troopers... That's I mean, yeah, like that's the entire reason why I put it as his third best prime. prime. I, I, I really would like Leslie to see it so that I can then make jokes with Leslie regarding, would you like to know more? Yeah. Okay. At this point, if like that's also where would you like to know more came into the cultural oeuvre. Sure is all a thing that y'all can try and inflict on me at some point in the near future. But uh, oh, we should probably try. go ahead and do a closing. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Close. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that makes sense. Stop outro. recording. Outro. Outro. Don't, don't stop recording yet. We need to record the outro. <laughs> no, no, there's outro. <laughs> and then stop recording. Thank you for listening to this episode of Heroes of the Hydean Way. You can find show updates on Twitter at The Hydean Way, and you can find me, Ben, on Twitter at Deuterium Ice. Uh, you can find Christine at Twelfth Night. That's 12th night with a K. Are you sure it's the K? I thought it was no K. <laughs> I'm not going to be held responsible for people. That uh, look you can up find the me person. on Twitter at Ace Picorito, A C E P I K O R I T O. You can't find me on Twitter because I've gone private because Twitter's a horrible place. You Fair can enough. find me at Ren out of time, but it's a private account, so sorry. I'm just sort of done with social media. Legit. Me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can find me at Leslet GS, soon to be at Twelfth Night without a K, just to annoy Christine. <laughs> 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 Gonna gonna get all the follows that are trying to follow Christine and don't realize they've gotten the wrong account. I'm gonna go to Twitter right now and see if Twelfth Night is a thing. <laughs> just gonna, the, yeah. the, the bio will just be Sans K. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are all at the Hydean Way, where you can find previous episodes. Okay, uh, you can find more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Plus, you can help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. I should let you do it because that's my least favorite one to read. <laughs> We're also on Facebook as The Hydean Way, and you can holocom us at heroes at com. If you like what we do and you want to support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash The Hydean Way. Don't know why I said it like that. I just felt like being yeah. sassy. Or you can send the team some calf at ko-fi.com slash The Hydean Way. I stole... Leslie's. That's Thieving Picorino! (laughs) Stole Christine's. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just be, hello, Christine, Cash, one, two, night with a K. <laughs> I mean, where's the lie? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>